take us into Wednesday morning as it was for the first couple of mornings this week, although the far southeastern parts of East Anglia may just see the odd pocket of frost to take us into Wednesday morning. Otherwise, Wednesday for the most part is a cloudier day and this area of rain will be slowly working its way from northwest to southeast of the day. It's going to be painful old progress. It's going to be slow and a good part of southern and eastern England probably staying dry throughout daylight hours. A bit more unsettled than midweek with these frontal systems trudging their way across the country. A bit of uncertainty to how quickly this clears away from the east on Thursday. But by Good Friday, pressure starting to build back in. So hopefully a fine end to the week after a couple of fairly wet, more unsettled days. Dry conditions by Friday and temperatures in the low teens. It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Co. Right, you're uh, an inspiration to us all. Click that bit on Well, you are. You, my, you, you, my, <laughs> my political ambitions are, those days are gone, I can tell you. She's um, only teasing. Go on. He's probably going to want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes to have one. <laughs> Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like Absolutely. on Jubes and Co. Come and join us. GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubery, weekday evenings at 6 o'clock. Start the day with GB News. We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock. It's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yes, yeah, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. We've got a brand new lineup every Saturday night on GB News. From 6 p.m., I'll give you my unique take on the world today. Then at 7, it's me, Calvin Robinson, with my common sense crusade. New to GB News is the Saturday Five. Five times the opinion. Join us every Saturday from 8 p.m. as we debate the week's stories. With us four, plus a special guest. And at 9, of course, it's Mark Dolan tonight. Brand new Saturday nights on GB News, Britain's news channel. Fear of being called racist is doing our country enormous harm. It's one of the major factors that led to the appalling grooming gang scandal. Well, today, the Prime Minister and Home Secretary have used language not heard before. They're talking tough. Will they deliver the results? And fear of being called racist is causing major problems in Yorkshire and Scottish cricket. We'll debate all of that. We'll go to New York, where Donald Trump is as we speak. In the air, he'll appear in court in New York on criminal charges tomorrow. And joining me on Talking Pints, Mike Osman, radio personality and without doubt the best Donald Trump impersonator I have ever seen or heard. But before all of that, let's get the news with Polly Middlehurst.
Nigel, thank you and good evening to you. Well, our top story tonight on GB News, the man who murdered Olivia Pratt Corbell in Liverpool was today sentenced to life in prison and will serve a minimum term of 42 years. Thomas Cashman shot the nine-year-old girl as he chased a convicted drug dealer into her home in August last year. Outside, the schoolgirl's mother, Cheryl Corbell, said her family has already started their life sentence, having to spend the rest of their lives without Olivia. Liv was the light of our lives, a sassy, chatty girl who never ran out of energy. She was a character. She was my baby and she has amazing qualities and knew what she wanted in life. Everyone adored her. She was the baby of, of our family and my little love, my shadow. Now everything we do and everywhere we go is a constant reminder that she is not there with us. All our promise for their future so cruelly taken away. Cheryl Corbell speaking outside Manchester Crown Court today. Well, in other news, as you've been hearing, the Prime Minister has announced a new task force to crack down on grooming gangs. Rishi Sunak said the measures aim to prevent victims and whistleblowers from being ignored by authorities because of cultural sensitivities or political correctness. And that's after the Home Secretary singled out British Pakistani men as a particular concern. Speaking exclusively to GB News, Suella Bravman said her comments on Pakistani men were based on local reviews and reports. It's not racist to tell the truth about what, what has been going on here in Rochdale or in Rotherham or in Telford. Local reviews and reports have confirmed that the grooming gangs uh, scandal that has gone on here has been uh, perpetrated by largely British Pakistani men. Now, it's important not to demonise a whole community and the vast majority of British Pakistanis are uh, law-abiding and uh, straightforward people. Teachers in England will go on strike for another two days next term after rejecting the latest government pay offer. They're going to walk out on the 27th of April and the 2nd of May with 98% of NEU members voting against what they described as an insulting offer of a £1,000 one-off payment plus an average rise of 4.5% pay increase for most staff next year. Now, Donald Trump is on his way to New York, where he's due to appear in court in Manhattan. The former US president has been indicted in relation to alleged hush money payments to the adult film star Stormy Daniels before his 2016 election campaign. Mr Trump will be arraigned, fingerprinted and photographed at court. His lawyer says he's going to be entering a plea of not guilty. He's also due to speak in Florida tomorrow. We'll be following that story closely for you right here on GB News. On TV, online, DAB Plus Radio and on the TuneIn app, this is GB News, the People's Channel, where now it's time to say happy birthday to Nigel Farage. Well, Polly, thank you. And good evening, everybody. Now, fear of being called racist was a direct contributor to the appalling grooming scandals that went on in Rotherham, in Rochdale, in Telford and in other parts of the country too. It could have been stopped, but it wasn't because the police and the authorities were scared that if they pointed the finger at one particular community, they would be accused of being racist. Well today has seen a very big change in the language. Firstly, Suella Braverman. And by the way, it's her birthday today as well. Suella Braverman saying, in the vast majority of cases, it was British Pakistani men who were causing the abuse. And the Prime Minister being equally strong, saying political correctness must not hold us back from dealing with the perpetrators. Now, this sort of language we wouldn't have seen under the premierships of Boris Johnson, Theresa May or David Cameron. They are now really starting to talk tough. They're going to set up a task force to deal with it. Now, that phrase does make me rather think back to the days of Tony Blair, uh, but they will also be doing their best to force people working in children's services that if they see any hint or suspicion of grooming, they are to report it. So there are some actions that are being proposed here. Well, I suppose you could say the same 
about the cross-channel boats. Lots of tough talk from the Prime Minister and from Suella Braverman. And yet, over the weekend, polling showing that 63% of the country don't think anything is going to materially change. So the question on grooming gangs is, will the tough talk lead to action? Tell me what you think. Farage at gbnews.uk. Now, Charlie Peters works for GB News. He is an investigative reporter. He produced an absolutely brilliant documentary film just a few months ago, Grooming Gangs, Britain's Shame. He's been up in Rochdale today. He interviewed Home Secretary Suella Braverman. Here's a clip of what she had to say. Ultimately, uh, silence enabled this abuse, silence on the part of professionals, fear of being called racist, fear about cultural sensitivities, fear about inflaming cohesion in communities. Uh, it is absolutely vital that we call out uh, the truth of what's been going on. And that's why mandatory reporting is an important tool in the armory of measures that we're announcing today. Yesterday, when you spoke about your incoming list of reforms, uh, you said that, I think correctly, that British Pakistanis are disproportionately overrepresented in this kind of child abuse, with one Labour politician describing this commentary as dog whistle politics. What do you make of this? It's not racist to tell the truth about what, what has been going on here in Rochdale or in Rotherham or in Telford. Local reviews and reports have confirmed that the grooming gangs uh, scandal that has gone on here has been uh, perpetrated by largely British Pakistani men. Now, it's important not to demonise a whole community and the vast majority of British Pakistanis are uh, law-abiding and uh, straightforward people. But it is also clear to say that in these towns, and I've met victims today who've confirmed as much, bearing out their own experience, that there have been cultural trends in the practices that we've seen. And authorities and professionals have turned a blind eye out of fear of being called racist. Political correctness can no longer be an obstacle to taking action. Well, Charlie Peters joins me now. Charlie, there's little doubt, in my view, that your very powerful documentary has actually helped to push the government into much, much tougher words, much tougher proposals, other than the language changing, which of itself, I accept, is significant. What do you think about their proposed actions and the likelihood that that's going to make any real difference on the ground? Well, survivors and campaigners I spoke to this morning describe the situation as one of cautious optimism. And I do share that because I think the reason why uh, I have such strong views on these policies is, as you note, I think they're kind of directly lifted from the recommendations we made in that documentary two months ago. The NCA supported task force is something that we've been calling for at GB News for a while now. And though, uh, Nigel, you suggested it has kind of Blairite connotations, the National Crime Agency has been absolutely vital in securing justice for grooming gang survivors in Rotherham, where they have secured hundreds of more survivors accessing support and many more prosecutions and convictions. They've been able to do that because they've parachuted in specialist officers who understand the situation and aren't tainted by local politics and local woke approaches to dealing with this issue. So I'm very keen on that policy indeed. And it was very interesting to hear the Home Secretary uh, propose how she would assess its success going forward today. But also, there's this renewed sense of focus on the recording of ethnicity data. Now, we know that this is something yeah. that police forces across the country have completely failed to do, and this has given us a very narrow understanding of the issue and has allowed the wider commentary and politicians to avoid talking about it seriously. Yeah, I mean, listen, I think, uh, you know, a cynic would say this has all come 10 years too late, but I think you're right. I think the recording of ethnicity data is a very, very big step in the right direction. I agree with that. Do you think it took a prime minister and a home secretary who both came themselves from ethnic minority backgrounds for the Conservatives to find the courage to do this? I think the problem we've had is not really the identity of the politicians, but we never really had the national conversation we needed about this issue when the lid blew off the scandal a decade ago. There was all this awkward discussion about the issue. There was very, very cautious, nervous and downright 
cowardly discussion of the demographics of the mm. perpetrators, overwhelmingly Pakistani in many of the 50 different towns and cities where these grooming gangs have occurred. And of course, people just did not care about the working class white girls who were mostly being abused. That's been the real cause of the problem. And my mission at GB News with this documentary and this wider investigation was to shift that national conversation, was to restart it and to show to people that there was a bigger truth out there that they weren't being shown. Well, Charlie, I have to say, I think you've done an absolutely brilliant job. You have shifted this agenda on and we'll watch over the course of the next months and years to see just how much of a difference it makes. Thank you for joining me this evening and well done on that conversation with Suella Braverman too. Well, it was Rotherham that first hit the headlines and Rotherham wasn't just a domestic story, I have to say, all over the world, America in particular. People could not believe that this had happened. David Greenwood, as a solicitor, who represented 32 of the Rotherham victims, and he joins me now. Um, David, has this all come many, many years too late? Yes, of course. It's come 25, 30 years too late. Yeah, we should have been aware of what was going on many, many years ago, and the police should have been right on it back from the very start, yeah. And it was, wasn't it? Fear of being called racist. Cowardice that led for this to persist year after year after year. I wouldn't say that's the only factor. Um, in Rotherham, in particular, uh, the Labour Party relied on the Pakistani um, minority in that town uh, for its votes. Um, and there was... Um, as Alexis J found in her report, uh, some reticence by police and local authority staff to, um, mm. to investigate these crimes for fear of rocking the boat in Rotherham. I don't know about other towns particularly in a lot of detail, um, but it was a mixture of, of that. Um, it was a mixture of um, police feeling as though these, these, these crimes are too hard to deal with and they the complainants, the, the girls, were hard to handle, and um, uh, a, a laziness uh, on, on the part of the police and the local authorities, and an unwillingness to, to get on with you know, the, the essential job that they should have been doing. Yeah, and when you look, David, at the list of proposals that are being put forward, you know, a task force headed up by the National Crime Agency, and we've yet to see who the appointees to it are. Let's hope they're not part of the London metropolitan elite. Uh, when you look at the ethnicity data that police are now going to be tasked with, you know, absolutely recording accurately and making available to the public, and one or two other of the recommendations. How, I mean, in your view of this, having studied this and fought hard for victims, how big a potential step in the right direction is this? It could be a really big step in the right direction, um, but you, you speak, Nigel, as though this is some kind of victory and, and, it's, and it's over and it's, it, it could be sorted. Um, <coughs> it isn't. Uh, the National Crime Agency went to Rotherham uh, with huge resources, um, and I doubt that, that kind of, those kinds of resources are going to be put into other towns and cities around the country where they are really needed. Um, so. Uh, let's see whether the government is really serious about this. Uh, they will need to put in a huge amount of money. The National Crime Agency in Rotherham and the, the support services they, that they brought with them were absolutely fantastic. They persuaded the girls to trust them uh, and they, they have got a lot of convictions so far and continue to get convictions. Uh, but it does need a massive amount of, of input. Yeah, David, I was just playing devil's advocate with the argument and trying to give the government the benefit of the doubt. Uh, now, I have to say, I'm rather with you. I think the resource that will be needed all over the country is not, you know, absolutely enormous. Uh, but I also kind of feel rather like the boat's crossing the channel, that, you know, the government are talking the language that the vast majority of people want to hear. The question of whether they can deliver uh, is, is something else. A final thought, perhaps, from you um, in Rotherham. Uh, do we think that this is now at a stop in Rotherham, or do you still have your suspicions? I still have suspicions that it will be going on today, this evening, in parts of Rotherham and other towns and cities across the country.
Yeah, well, that is that is depressing. Well, look, the language has changed. It, it looks better than it did before. Uh, well done for the work you've done in the past, and thank you for joining us tonight on the programme. So David Greenwood there making clear that, in his view, uh, there was also a political reason little was done, because, in his words, the Labour Party in Rotherham relied on the votes from the Pakistani community, that it was just too tough, too difficult for the police and others to deal with. But there is no doubt that fear of being called racist was a major part of this. And you know something? It's going right through our national life. People are very, very fearful, because, you see, an accusation gets made, and it can be justified or not, and people get cancelled. That happened to Michael Vaughan, former Yorkshire and England cricket captain. Two years of hell because a man called Azim Rafiq from Yorkshire Cricket Club accused him of racism. In a moment, we'll talk about what fear of being called racist is doing to cricket. But don't think this is just cricket we're talking about. This could be any walk of our national life. It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Co. Right, you're uh, an inspiration to us all. Clip that bit off. Well, you are. You, my, you, you, no. <laughs> my political ambitions are those days are gone, I can tell you. She's um, only teasing. Go on. He's probably going to want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes. <laughs> Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like Absolutely. on Jubes and Co. Come and join us. GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubery, weekday evenings at 6 o'clock. Start the day with GB News. We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock. It's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yes, yeah, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers. Tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway. Headliners every night from 11 on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. We've got a brand new lineup every Saturday night on GB News. From 6 pm, I'll give you my unique take on the world today. Then at 7, it's me, Calvin Robinson, with my common sense crusade. New to GB News is the Saturday Five. Five times the opinion. Join us every Saturday from 8 pm as we debate the week's stories. With us four, plus a special guest. And at 9, of course, it's Mark Dolan tonight. Brand new Saturday nights on GB News, Britain's news channel. So the tough talk from the Prime Minister and the Home Secretary, is it actually going to make a real difference? Kat says, I hope so. This has been ignored for far too long. Yes, as I say, all of what's been said today should have been said ten years ago. But at last, 
the narrative of the conversation is changing. Morris says at least they are trying to tackle grooming gangs. Ask Labour what they would do. Well, Labour were out and about today talking about law and order, in particular antisocial behaviour. But don't worry, Morris, we will examine in detail all of Labour's proposals on this and everything else. Another says, 13 years, they did nothing, why should we trust them? Well, I tell you what. I have to say, I can't disagree with that wholly. And finally, one viewer says, no, the Tory party are all talk and no action. Sunak and Braverman are about as much use as a chocolate teapot at stopping illegal boat crossings. So forgive me for not believing them when they say they're going to get tough on grooming gangs. Well, we will have to see. Now, so much of what happened in Rotherham went wrong was because people were fearful of being called racist. And my goodness me, cricket is going through this in a big, big way. It has been now for many, many months. Let's examine it and see perhaps if we can learn some lessons. It all kicked off at Yorkshire Cricket Club. Azim Rafiq making a series of allegations against the number of players. One or two of the players said, yeah, hands up. I said things in my dressing room that I probably shouldn't have said. But when it came to Michael Vaughan, you know, Michael Vaughan, captain of Yorkshire and, of course, famously captain of that 2005 Ashes winning team. Vaughan said, look, this is completely and utterly unfair. He was supposed to have made a comment about a collective group of Asian cricketers. Vaughan denied it. And yet, it cost him his job at the BBC. Michael Vaughan was effectively cancelled. And he wrote and was interviewed in the Sunday Telegraph yesterday just saying, what hell? he and his family had been through for the last two years. Well, the inquiry has found that actually there's no case to answer. But these accusations by Rafiq have put Yorkshire in a deeply precarious position. They could even go into administration. Now, I don't think that's actually going to happen, but that's how much they've lost in sponsorship and everything else. And yet, this is the same Azim Rafiq, who texts to a mate a message, and they're talking about a fellow cricketer, they've been out for dinner, and who's paid the bill? And Rafiq says, ha ha, he is a Jew. Only Jews do that sort of thing. Well, there is the most enormous double standard going on here. You know, Azim Rafiq, apparently, he's allowed to make comments that I think anybody would describe as anti-Semitic, and yet, poor old Michael Vaughan has had two years out in the wilderness. And it's going on in Scotland. It's going on in Scotland, too, where a similar scandal broke. They chose a new chairman six months ago, Anjan Luthra, somebody who'd played cricket for Scotland in the past. He produced a six-month report talking about cricket in Scotland. And whilst, of course, he acknowledged the previous accusations of racism, he said that this was not the only issue. Oh, they've gone mad at him for that. Cricket Scotland and a group called Running Out Racism, a lobby group, as Luther called them, and they say his report is a disgrace because his, his report focuses on progress of the game of cricket in Scotland and not obsessing on racism. And he's resigned from his position. I'm joined by Pat Pocock, former Surrey and England cricketer. Pat, I'm thinking, you know, it's a competitive team sport. Not everybody in the dressing room is always going to be best mates with each other. I'm sure things... I mean, things must get said. Yes, I'm not surprised that people, are, uh, s uh, sponsors, are looking at their sponsorships because they tend to follow uh, the public opinion and the way the, way the public think. Um, cricket is a very unique game. Um, I would say amongst the players, there are, uh, they uh, admire half the people in the world who are, are, are uh, the, the non-white players. Uh, so I personally, I run a group, I send eight emails out to non-white people every single day mm. and I invited them to join my group because they're mates of mine and but I think you cannot get away uh, cricket mirrors life in the street cricket mirrors life is there racism yes there is racism but but you've got to look you can't just say that without looking at at, at what goes on because Banter is absolutely everything. Banter is said, and uh, I can absolutely promise you that you will have some people who are non-white and they are and they're in a pub in the evening, and uh, they might have uh, people uh, might have said a few a few fairly comical in quotes uh, 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 
a word. But if they're in this pub mm. and they're being threatened at all or having a pressure put on them, mm. they will be round them and they'll be all part of the team. And cricket is a unique game because there's no other game where you spend so much time with your yeah. teammates. Um, you on on the, in the professional cricket, for example, you might spend six hours, eight hours. If you're on a way trip, you might spend 18 hours, and you might even be rooming with somebody, so you spend the 24 hours. And yet, the thing about these accusations against Michael Vaughan, you know, a very distinguished modern cricketer, yep. I think a terrific commentator. Yep. I love listening to him on yep. the radio, watching him on the telly, um, and he's been out, you know, out for two years on accusations that have proved to be groundless. I mean, I mean are we... We want a society in which people behave reasonably and fairly. We want cricket to reflect that. Very much. But, but haven't we just gone mad on this? Yes, I, is, is the short answer to, uh, to that. But, but as I say, you cannot really take a racist comment uh, in isolation. You must look at the way it's actually said um, and what they mean by it and what they're trying to say and are they trying to make it funny? Is it, is it mm. a permanent... Is it a permanent mm. comment? And and the way they say it, oh, you must, uh, you cannot really uh, uh, judge people on banter unless you know the way and the method it's said. Yeah, it's about context, isn't it? I, yes. mean, that, I mean, that's really the point. It's about yes. context. Yes. It seemed to me that Rafiq just had this grudge, and it seemed to me that the cricketers in Scotland that have made allegations. It's almost as if they want to bring the game down and the game is in danger of allowing that to happen. I can't think of a game that has brought more people from more countries and more races around the world together than cricket. Uh, and uh, uh, the players all know this, and uh, that's why uh, so many people you... As I said, 50% of the people you admire in this world yeah, of playing yeah, yeah. more than any other are non-white. I can't think, I, yeah, as you say, there's no sport that's brought countries and different people together like it. Final quick thought. Are we going to win the Ashes this summer? We stand a very good chance, but whether we play the baseball uh, in the same way, I think they're going to have to tone it down because... Uh, when people score 50 or 60 runs, the old-fashioned way of playing is going on and getting 100. And if they keep on doing this and getting out for 50s or 60s when they're well in, mm. then they might start looking at that. Wise that, words. That, perhaps we might be able to make this a little bit better. Wise and, words from a veteran cricketer, Pat Pocock. And let's hope to goodness that this racism stuff is put to bed. Those who've done wrong, yes, they get punished. But poor people like Michael Vaughan should not be, should not be cancelled from public life on the baseless allegations of one person who, in my view, appears to bear a grudge and whose own stable is far from clean. In a minute, we go to New York. Darren McCaffrey is there outside Trump Tower. The aeroplane is on its way. So we're going to talk to you about his court appearance tomorrow and his speech tomorrow night at Mar-a-Lago. Back with you in just a second. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. Oh, I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it. Like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain is watching.
You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are. We don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you All know Kate Moss? <laughs> Apparently. Uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I have walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. I campaigned in the largest democratic vote in our island story. I know this country has so much to be proud of. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. The wisdom of the nation is in its people. Vox Populi, Vox Dei. That's why I'm joining the People's Channel. Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Donald Trump will appear in a New York courtroom tomorrow facing a criminal charge. It'll happen at 2.15 Eastern Time, 7.15 UK Time. Well, there outside Trump Tower right now is GB News political host Darren McCaffrey. Darren, um, what's happening? Uh, tell me. I understand that the aeroplane has taken off from Palm Beach and is now on its way. Yeah, indeed. Uh, Donald Trump left about an hour and a half ago, as you say, going from Florida up here to New York. That flight normally takes around three to four hours, and we're expecting him essentially to arrive in the next couple of hours. He is going to spend tomorrow night in Trump Tower, where he is going to wait that courtroom appearance on Tuesday. And it's going to be a really significant moment. Never before has a former or current US president faced a criminal indictment in this country. Now, he is going to deny the charges. We're going to see the full charge sheet tomorrow. He's going to plead not guilty in that uh, court case. But it all comes at a time, of course, in which there's increased security here in New York. We had been expecting a couple of protesters today. I have to say there are a couple of dozen of them uh, gathered behind me, but not in big numbers. Though that could well change tomorrow. There is expected to be an organised rally in Iran. Trump, Nigel's going to turn up here in New York. He's going to go to that courtroom. He's going to get swabbed for his DNA. He's going to have his fingerprints taken. He is going to have his mugshot uh, taken as well, though we do not think he's going to be handcuffed. And that pre-hearing, if you like, where we'll hear that charge sheet, it's going to last roughly an hour. And then he's going to leave New York again, go back to Florida and address his supporters uh, tomorrow night. It'll be a really, really significant moment. It clearly could have a big impact on his prospects of becoming a Republican nominee and indeed the next president of the United States. Uh, it's going to have a really, really significant impact, I reckon, on US politics. And we're going to have to wait and watch what will be a pretty historic day uh, tomorrow. It will, Darren, and we'll be joining you live uh, tomorrow night, absolutely at that time of the court appearance. Thank you very much indeed, Darren McCaffrey. Well, I have to say, I think the whole thing is an absolute disgrace. Openly, overtly political. You know, Richard Nixon did wrong, but he was pardoned. Bill Clinton, well, he wasn't just involved in paying off women. He actually lied in open testimony, and yet he was pardoned too. But a Democrat dominated judiciary in New York uh, have decided to make this overtly political move. It is wrong. It is dangerous. I personally believe Trump will emerge more strongly from it. Now, on a slightly lower level, low traffic neighbourhoods. Yes, one of those wonderful schemes being pushed by Mayor Khan and some others around the country, which meant during lockdown, they just blocked off roads that we've been using for a long, long time. Report by the Taxpayers Alliance saying that 240 important ambulance journeys to hospital have been held up because of LTNs, including people who are undergoing cardiac arrest. The worst offenders are the boroughs of Southwark, Enfield 
and Ealing. So well done, Mayor Khan. Very well done for encouraging all the London boroughs to do this. And talk about a what the Farage moment. I thought to begin with, it must be an April Fool's joke, but it wasn't April the 1st. It was actually April the 2nd in the mail on Sunday. This story broke that a senior Conservative Tory MP received a phone call at four o'clock in the morning from a backbencher. And the unnamed Tory said, I'm in a brothel. I don't know how I got here, and I can't find my clothes. Now, the Conservative Party have not said who this person is, because the list of suspects is simply so long. Now, that was a joke. Now, in a moment, I'll be joined by a very successful radio host, but all-round impressionist, and possibly does the best Donald Trump I know. Mike Osmond joins me in a moment on Talking Pines. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's already in waiting, they're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, three till six. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. Three till six p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. GB News has its own late night paper preview show, Headliners, where comedians take you through the next day's top news stories. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Headliners, every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture, and sometimes even some ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at seven o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panelists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from seven on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Coming up on Dan Wooten tonight, after Suella Braverman singled out British Pakistani men over concerns about grooming gangs, is she and Rishi Sunak right that political correctness has allowed evil criminals to flourish? Plus, as Keir Starmer still says a woman can have a penis, can Labour be trusted to protect the rights of biological women? Join Dan, Kelvin McKenzie, Angela Levin and more of Britain's top commentators, 9 to 11pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. Before I introduce my Talking Pints guest, I did say earlier he was a rather good Donald Trump impersonator. Here he is, in action. OK, 
Okay, I'm so excited to be here in the UK. I really am. It's tremendous, and I'm very proud to come over on my way to the five-star Dorchester Hotel, London, to meet Prime Minister Farage. <laughs> Mike Osman joins me on Talking Bites. Prime Minister Farage, you like the sound of that, Nigel. Mm. Come on. Because he did want me to be the... Um, he is. He wanted me to be the ambassador, didn't he? But, yeah. but the Tory party would never have anything oh. to do with that. Now, Mike, Southampton is a big part of who you are. Absolutely, yeah. And, you know, going back centuries, there have been young lads growing up in Southampton who've joined the Royal Navy. <laughs> yes, yeah. And that's exactly what you did. Yeah, well, I was an apprentice fitter and turner, and so my dad was chuffed to bits, one of seven boys, so I was right in the middle, three younger, three older. Jim Davison introduced me in Scotland once. <laughs> Good old Jim, I think he's watching. And he said, here's Mike Osmond, the best looking of seven boys, which will give you an idea how ugly the others are. <laughs> so, thank you for that, Jim. <laughs> yeah, and so, but my younger brother, Alan, decided he was going to join the Royal Navy, so in our council house in Millbrook, Southampton, and there was all the lead, he bought all the brochures home and I'd been an apprentice fitter and turner for two years at More Green Metal Industries and loved it and then I saw this and I thought that's a bit of me I'm going to join the Royal Navy so I went to be dad I'm joining the Royal Navy day you're bloody not you carry on with your bloody apprentice no that was me and I had five and a half great years and now I'm uh, I'm a trustee of the Falklands Veterans Foundation yep. and I'm also involved in the British Forces Foundation as well vice president and very proud of it but I, I was really lucky I saw everywhere. I went all over the world. That was when we had fuel. You know, we were allowed to go around the world. <laughs> and chips. And yeah, chips. Like, and, yeah, sort of... and, and we used to go, you know, <laughs> fly the flag. It's something I've noticed, Mike. There's a guy called Stephen Pound, former Labour MP. Stephen Pound, who I've just met, and Stephen right. and I, when I was on another radio station, yeah. Now, people like you and him, there is a thing, I think was a thing, called naval humour, naval yeah. banter. Mm. I can almost tell within 20 minutes of meeting someone whether yeah. they I mean, is that... You're living cheek by jowl with yeah. each other. I think that it's almost like gallows humour. That's how the forces get through the tough times, whether it be, you know, First World War, Second World War, Afghanistan conflicts, whatever it is, it is gallows, gallows humour. And it's also what Pat Pocock was talking about, the banter in a mess deck of yeah. 60 stokers. And I had just the greatest time because I could do, you know, as an impressionist, learning all the accents from around the country was absolutely perfect. And, of course, all the officers who were very, very posh. So, yeah. so it gave me the opportunity to work on people like King Charles. Who, of course, was a naval officer. Yes, of course he was. He was my boss. Absolutely marvellous. <laughs> so that's how it all, you know, great, great grounding. And I, I'm very proud of my time. Were you at school doing impressions? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was the naughty boy. In fact, Paul Slater, who was my wife, and now Jill and I have been together for since we were 15, and Paul Slater was her head of house, a sports, 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 sports teacher, and he said to her, what are you doing going out with Osman? I was a year older, but only by a week. Yeah, what are you doing going out with that idiot? And, uh, well, there you go. 43 years later, we're still well, together. Well, some is what work. did he know? No, what some is work. Yeah, yeah. So where does the move? How do you you go from that to... I mean, suddenly, you know, one minute you're a naval stoker yeah. and then two or three years later you're appearing on big 1980s Generation yeah, Game. Copycats. Yeah, Generation Copycats. Game, all yep. of that with Jim, funny enough, uh, Des O'Connor show. I think it happened because I always knew, always knew at school, I always said that, you know, when you're older brother, so I was right in the middle, three older, three younger, my oldest brother, Trevor, would beat the hell out of us because he kept us in line, and rightly so, and I must have been an awful, you know, to, to deal with. But I always said, if you can make them laugh when they're punching you, they can't punch you so hard, <laughs> right? It's true. So I always knew that I wanted to do it, and uh, there's a guy called Bob Phillips, a great friend, who, who phoned London Weekend Television a hundred times and said, you've got to see this guy, Mike Osman, and, and would never get through, and eventually got through to a guy called Vic Finch, the producer of Copycats, said, you need to see Mike Osman. Why? Because he does Alfida Zane, he does Only Fools and Horses, Dirty Dare. No one was doing those voices in them days. And that's what happened. We did the audition and they signed me that day. It was incredible. F from this council had lad, Royal Navy, Apprentice Fitter and Turner, a roof tiler with my older brother's business. You know, I'm suddenly on Saturday Night TV, 20 million viewers.
Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. some of these TV programs, X Factor, would kill for those numbers. You know, was the money big in TV then? Money was was uh, <laughs> nothing to do with you know, two. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a reasonable question. <laughs> no, it was okay. It was okay. But what it was, it was a, a spring. <laughs> It seems a reasonable question. I think you're fired. I'm going to ask that. So, so I think that was you, by the way. I know. I don't know if anyone realised. So I think, yeah, it, it was good. And what it was was a springboard for everything else, for everything else that I've done, you know, and 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 where I've earned good money at different things at, Ca at Capital Radio for six and a half years. Yeah, I'm going to come to that. Uh, I the, I first met you about thirty years ago. Yeah. Um, at a series of Christmas events. Yeah. Down in Hampshire. Yeah. Uh, Corporate entertainment, mm. big Christmas, well, booze ups, I suppose. In they those, were in yeah. those days, With Chris Smith, the Chris right. Smith booze ups, yeah, and they were, weren't they? Yeah, they were, but they were great, great events for me. And and you know, I met some fantastic people. Met your sister in law, Wendy, yeah. who I never realised was your sister in law. Yeah, and she said. She used to send me pictures of you fishing and stuff. And I think, why is Wendy so... Then I suddenly <laughs> clicked and I went, of course, Nigel is her brother-in-law. Yeah, 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 she yeah. is a lovely brother. Yeah, the surname was a clue, but never mind. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, forgive me, Nigel. On the corporate circuit now, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm guessing that doing Donald Trump, as you do it... It's been the best five years of my life as an entertainer. I have worked in the best venues. I even worked at Trump Turnbury, and it was a big wedding up in Scotland, and they had these huge glass doors. Father of the Bride speaks last, and he said, the only person we haven't uh, thanked tonight is the owner of the hotel. These huge... And I can't believe the manager let me do it, and I'm sure if Donald sees this, <laughs> that manager will be fired. They opened these huge glass doors, and there I was in all my glory with the wig and everything, and... So good, so good. Believe me. And they thought it was Donald Trump, you know? <laughs> Honestly, it, it's just the most fun. And it's not political in any way. It's just a funny act. And what does, he, what does he say to the court tomorrow in New York? What does he say? It's all fake news, you know, fake news. I mean, I was called a racist, Nigel. Racist. Believe me, racist. Can you believe that, Nigel? I'm not a racist. I'm going to prove it. I was invited to Desmond Tutu. Desmond Tutu. <laughs> Desmond Tutu's <laughs> birthday party. Desmond Tutu. Now, I don't know. I don't know. If you know how hard it is to sing happy birthday to Desmond Tutu. <laughs> happy birthday to Tutu. What made it worse, Nigel, he was 92, two, two. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, you've had so much fun doing it. Mm. Well, who knows? He, I mean, well, I tell you what, he's going to be in the news hugely between, Shall be. between now and the next, mm. and, and the next presidential yeah. election. That yeah. I've got no doubt. But radio, Capital Gold, you had a fantastic show on Capital Gold with a big audience. Yeah, we had 1.7 million listeners on yeah. Medium Wave, which is a really... <laughs> for people who don't even know what Medium Wave is, but it was a really clunky signal. And Richard Park took a chance on me, saw me at a boxing dinner, put me on, and, and it was just six and a half fantastic years. It's that My life sort of goes in spells, you know. I had a brilliant time, and we toured off the back of it and sold out to theatres, and we'd always finish at the London Palladium. The last show of the tour would be the London Palladium. So very, very lucky. And now, of course, uh, another radio station. I mean, you love radio. Yeah. You clearly love doing mm. radio. And I did it before this. Well, we do both here, of course. Yeah, yeah. You know, we, you know we're still all casting I on, do know, yeah. On DAB. You're a GB News fan, I understand. I am. Well, I think it's the only place to get balanced news. That's what I think. And what I think about GB News is I think they have been so clever in, in the people they brought in. You know, I'm a huge fan of Jacob Rees-Mogg, for instance. You know, and, and some of the presenters, just absolute. And you, Nigel, because you know we, we talked to you about coming to join our I know. great British radio. I know, but we I, know. Got the... I was nearly paid. He turned us down. You heard it first. He, said, yeah. no. he I was... said, oh, thank you very much. Thanks for the offer. But no. <laughs> it wasn't quite like that, but it was so, very nice. Great British radio. Mm. Um, Breakfast and... show, Monday to Friday, 7 till 10. All the impressions. Charlie Mullins. Charlie Mullins, the chairman. Yes, Boris just popped in to, uh, to say hello. I don't know if you've seen uh, 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 Ch uh, Nigel. Yeah, Charlie Mullins, great man. Uh, uh, the Chelsea sank Potter yes. For, yes. for poor results. Uh, Leicester. 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 Sacked, uh, da, 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 sacked uh, their manager for poor, 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 poor results. And um, uh, Sadiq Khan, I've got him in a treble. So, fingers crossed, <laughs> Nigel. Come on. <laughs> yes. Great British radio. So, you're, you're doing a non-news 
Radio. No news is good news. Now, we absolutely, and coming into a studio that is all about <laughs> news, I've got to be really careful well, there's, different, there's different markets. There's different markets yeah. out there. So we believe in uh, something different, to give people an, a lift, lift their spirits. My show, 7 till 10 on Great British Radio, Monday <laughs> to Friday, best of Saturday, 10 till midday, is all about fun. It's all about the impressions. You know, I we do this really clever thing with Tuffers coming into the studio. Yeah. Tuffers does our text. And he's great. And, and it's all layered but it's me so i'll be going it's great british radio on a monday morning time for tms toughest messaging so oh yeah I tell you what here's a text from nigel nigel sent us a text box. but it's all layered so it feels like so nigel's interrupt uh, nigel you're nigel so toughest is interrupting me while i'm doing the text messages and it's very very funny nigel and we play great music so uh, we we realize there is a place for news of course yeah, there is yeah, yeah, yeah. but i think the way news is it's 24 7 it's mm. incessant I think there are certain news organisations that are about frightening people, about yeah, panicking, uh, yeah, whereas yeah. I think you come here, come to GB News, it's it's Well, balanced. I hope you're right. And you've extended your broadcast reach today to Southampton. We're in Hampshire. Hampshire on DAB, and we're absolutely yeah. thrilled for me to go back yeah. to my home territory. Today. Shame about the football club, isn't oh, it? Oh, well, we're doomed, we're doomed. <laughs> <laughs> we are, we're, we're, oh, but I have got to say, the Duke David Dickinson just popped in. Nigel, for your viewers, have we got a Bobby Dazzler of an auction prize right now? Two tickets to see Southampton's next home game or four quid for cash? It's up to you. <laughs> yeah, we are in serious trouble. Yeah, no, and you love that club. I love it. Well, Matt Letizier was my best friend. We had a nightclub together. I used to do the pre-match warm-up. You know, can you imagine that? Being asked to come and yeah. do the warm-up for the team that you've loved all your life. You know, I was there in 1976 when Bobby Stokes scored the winning goal in the FA Cup final when we were no-hopers against Man United. It was never offside. Sir Alex always said, <laughs> offside, whenever I see him, I said, oh, goal is offside. It wasn't. So, you know, very lucky to do that. And to warm a crowd up with 30, 32,000 was something, something and, else. And, Mike, you've never been cancelled. Your, your, your brand of humour, impressions, fun... Yeah. I think it's, you know, you have to be so careful nowadays. You and I both know that. And the subjects you've covered tonight, beautifully and sensitively, by the way. But it is tough now mm, to no, be... So even when I get stuff, you know, I've got some great writers. Uh, Mickey Pugh out there, Bob Phillips, Alan Whiteman, fantastic writers. And I write myself. But when you, you know, when I see stuff and I, I'm sort of editing, I'm going, we can't do this. I know, it's and particularly when you've got sponsors. And yeah, you yeah. Know, no, it's difficult. We, it's difficult. I'd like to thank it's Barrett difficult. Holmes. For spot. Can I say that? No, right. no, oh, sorry, no, sorry, you're going to be fired. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Nigel will never be fired. <laughs> Mike, you said a moment ago you're an admirer of Jacob Rees Mogg. I am, 100%. Now, he's actually standing about no. six, six feet behind no. you. So, what I'm going to ask is that you, as Jacob Rees Mogg, please welcome Jacob Rees Mogg. Can I take, Rees -Mogg take the point with chair. me? It's entirely up to you, Dubai. Jacob, Jacob Rees Mogg, my goodness me, Vox Day, Vox Star. Lovely to see you, sir. I am a huge fan. Ladies and gentlemen, Jacob Rees-Mogg will now take to the stage with the great <laughs> Nigel Farage. <laughs> and I, I will say home. farewell, good night, God bless, and Vox D, Vox D. Thank you very much. Well, well, you can go home. You can <laughs> sit home. Home. He's the most polite man in the world. Oh, That's what I love about Jacob. <laughs> well, Jacob, that was an unusual introduction, but a very good one. Excellent one, yes. What have you got coming up this well, we're evening? We're going to be talking about the Trans-Pacific Partnership and how really important that is and how actually it embeds Brexit, that it gives us a real opportunity to move away from the dead hand of the European Union. Yeah, it's a huge... And do I understand you've got Gina Miller coming? I here? have, yes. We're delighted to have Gina on because she's such a champion for the other side the argument. She puts it very well and we only like to have the best um, spokesman Absolutely. the other well, side on here. I think the establishment are going to fight very hard against this new trade deal with all sorts of scare stories and all the rest of it. No, important subject. Great to see and you. Happy birthday. Thank you very much indeed. Very good. Now, we are done. Let's get the all-important weather before Jacob's show. Hello again, I'm Stephen Keats and this is your latest Met Office forecast. And after a lovely day through Monday, many places will see a dry and fairly clear night with a widespread frost developing underneath those clear skies. That is away from the far northwest where this weather system will be bringing thicker cloud and some bits and pieces of light rain and drizzle to the far west of Northern Ireland, western most parts of Scotland. Here, not turning too cold with a bit more breeze and the cloud cover, so temperatures 4 or 5 degrees, but elsewhere under clearing skies, temperatures falling away quite sharply after sunset 
and there'll be a widespread frost to take us into Tuesday morning. So it certainly will be a cold start, might need to scrape a few cars first thing Tuesday morning, but those temperatures coming up quite smartly underneath the strong April sunshine. And for much of England and Wales, it will be another predominantly sunny day. Although further west across parts of England and Wales, as well as the southern and eastern Scotland, those blue skies have been replaced by some hazier conditions, some high level clouds spilling in. Cloudy for Northern Ireland and the far west of Scotland, but rainfall amounts quite small. And for most of us, it will be a relatively warm day after that chilly start.